It's strange how the greatest acts of evil can sometimes originate from the best of intentions. How we can be so desperate to accomplish our plans that we would be ready to take drastic measures and to abandon our sense of right and wrong. Throughout Sauron's history, he committed many terrible and evil deeds, and it's hard to imagine that he didn't find some way to justify it in his mind, even if he used extremely twisted logic. Hey guys, it's Carl here. And in today's episode, we'll be delving into the philosophy of Sauron and the reason behind his fall to evil. So Sauron wasn't always an evil tyrant, and he actually started off as a benevolent Meyer spirit with good intentions. He was driven by a single goal, which was noble in a certain sense. Because what Sauron wanted most of all was to create a perfect world in which everyone worked efficiently together in a very coordinated manner. And so it was a world that was full of order, which overcame confusion and waste. Now there really wasn't anything bad with these wishes and hopes, though Sauron began to grow too impatient to achieve his vision, and he started to admire Morgoth, the first Dark Lord, because he was impressed by Morgoth's power and will, and how he could bring about his plans in a very quick and masterful way. Sauron began to feel that his best chance of securing his goals was to follow Morgoth. And if all of this sounds familiar to you, it's probably because it's very similar to why Saruman became evil and fell to corruption. I've already covered this a few weeks ago, and so I'll try and avoid repeating myself as much as possible. Though I do feel that it's important to mention that both Sauron and Saruman were Meyer spirits that used to serve Aule, the smith of the Valar, and so they were both linked with the act of creation. There's a very interesting connection in Tolkien's works, between the act of creation and the fall to corruption. Because creation can lead to ambition, feelings of ownership, pride, impatience and self-importance. And all of these traits can be very dangerous and drive you to corruption, unless your own wisdom and humility can hold you back. Now throughout the first age, Sauron would commit some incredibly horrible deeds. Though in his mind, all of this was justified so that he could create this paradise that he dreamt of. Some sacrifices had to be made so that he could achieve this level of order, planning and organization, and he was sure that the good would eventually outweigh the bad, and that all of this was for the benefit of all living things. He was ready to focus his entire willpower on this one objective, which he saw as the greater good. The excuse of the greater good is something that we see quite often in our own history, and for some reason, it's always accompanied by some of the worst atrocities that humanity has experienced. Tolkien actually makes this comparison by saying that Sauron's fall to evil was quite similar to that of real-life dictators. Now when Sauron chose to follow Morgoth, I wonder if he was a bit deluded or narrow-minded, because their end goals were totally incompatible. Morgoth planned to eradicate all life and destroy the world of Arda, which sounds like chaos to me. And I can't see how that would work with Sauron's goal for order for the good of all living beings. There's a lot that we can say about this subject, and it's really a fascinating topic, though it's best to leave it for its own video. Now Morgoth was finally defeated at the end of the First Age by the forces of the Valar, and they ordered Sauron to appear before them for judgment. This might have given Sauron a chance of redemption and mercy, though he was too scared of being punished, and so he chose to escape and hide in the lands of Middle-earth. These lands had suffered tremendously in the War of Wrath, and they were left broken and in ruins. And in that moment, Sauron hoped that he could use his skills to heal what was left of the world, and to reorganize and restore its beauty. This was a perfect chance for him to atone for all the harm that he caused. And at first, he did have good altruistic intentions, and he did try to be benevolent. But once again, his impatience would prove to be his undoing. He wanted to speed up the land's recovery as fast and efficiently as possible, but he felt that the people of these lands weren't smart or wise enough to rule and order themselves, and that the only way for them to reach their greatest potential was under his guidance, his vision and his rule. At this point, he didn't care about conquering their lands, because all he wanted was to create a paradise for the physical and economic well-being of all the inhabitants of Middle-earth and the only way for him to achieve this dream was if he was in command. It's clear that because of Sauron's pride, he felt that he was the best candidate to act as the central authority, and he was determined to exert his power and his will. And so Sauron slowly began to fall into corruption once more, as he tried to achieve complete power for what he thought was the greater good. According to Tolkien, 
When someone tries to control other people's minds, they would become very prone to corruption. And it doesn't matter if they had good intentions, or if it was done for a good purpose, even if it was for the benefit of the dominated individual. The act in itself was something forbidden, for it was a crime against the creations of Iluvatar, the god of Middle-earth. Tolkien also wrote that Sauron was influenced by Morgoth's nihilism to a certain extent, and even though he never became an extreme nihilist like Morgoth, who desired to destroy everything, Sauron did inherit his hatred for God, and he wanted to eradicate the order and values that Iluvatar created, and to replace them with his own. And the more Sauron rebelled against Iluvatar, the more he began to hate men and elves, and to see them as tools for his end goal. There's a very clear relationship between the rejection of God and the fall to corruption, which I imagine was inspired by Tolkien's own theological beliefs, and Sauron is a perfect reflection of this. Another great example is when we look at the fall of Numenor. For as long as the Numenorians worshipped the Luvatar, they remained a moral and good people, and so Sauron knew that if he wanted to corrupt them, he had to find something to replace the Luvatar in the minds of men that would go against his teachings and push them away from God. And this is why he promoted the worship of Morgoth, which eventually led to the corruption of the Numenorians and the destruction of their civilization and home. This was obviously very hypocritical and manipulative on his part, because Sauron could never be a true atheist. After all, he was one of the spirits that had helped to create the universe, but promoting the worship of Morgoth, or even atheism itself, helped his cause by weakening any resistance that he faced. Now Sauron found that the elves were much harder to control compared to men, who were very easily corrupted, and this is probably why Sauron hated the elves and Valar much more than he hated men. He would try to bring these factions under his control by promising them the things that they wanted most of all. For example, he could very easily ensnare men by promising them immortality, while he knew that the elves of Middle-earth were deeply saddened by the passage of time and that they missed the blissful and unchanging nature of the Undying Lands. And so Sauron tried to seduce them by telling them that together they could create a place that was similar to Valinor in Middle-earth, a paradise that was unaffected by time. Though most of the elves saw through this deceit, and they rejected his offer, apart from the elves of Eregion, who would help him to create the Rings of Power. This was actually the main purpose behind these rings, and why Sauron created the One Ring, for he hoped to use it to dominate and control the minds of the elves and the rest of the free people, and it wasn't just to increase his own power. Now when Sauron noticed how much the elves and men admired his knowledge, and how easily he could influence them, his pride and ego began to grow to incredible levels, and he saw himself as a god-king. He took up the title of Kings of Kings and the Lord of the World, and the lands that were under his control were a mixture of a kingdom and an evil theocracy. By now he was much more corrupted, and his aspirations were more selfish and extreme, for it wasn't enough for him to simply shape the world as he saw fit, but he also wanted to have absolute control over the world and to be worshipped by all rational beings as a god. He was still open to allowing his enemies to live, such as the elves or the men of Gondor, as long as they agreed to be his subjects. We can see how Sauron's pride, ego and delusion kept growing over time, for in the Second Age he claimed to be Morgoth's representative, while by the end of the Third Age he said that he was Morgoth returned. At this point, he also had a very warped perspective of people and events. For after the fall of Numenor, the continent of Amman, or the Undying Lands, was removed from the physical world of Arda, and Sauron felt that this was a clear sign that Iluvatar had abandoned his creation, and that the Valar had failed, and that they chose to neglect the lands of Middle-earth. Sauron even saw the wizards as some desperate attempt by the Valar to reclaim their lost power in Middle-earth, as if it were some foolish effort of defeated imperialists, for by now he had become so evil that he believed that Manwe, who was the lord of the Valar, was motivated by the same aspirations as his own. And it's actually quite amusing that after Saruman betrayed the free people and turned evil, Sauron felt that this confirmed his beliefs on the Valar's intentions and the mission of the wizards. One of the most interesting areas in which I believe that we can clearly see Sauron's philosophy is in the Orcs. He managed to turn a race that had a very chaotic nature into an ordered force for the most part and the backbone of his army, with a significant level of organization such as their patrols, signals and chain of command. 
and after Sauron's defeat, we can see how they lost their order and coordination and became a disorganized rabble once more. I feel that as Sauron became more evil with time, his end goals were less defined, kind of like taking a step backwards. At first he wanted power so that he could bring about order to benefit the free people, and then it slowly regressed to focusing on order and shaping the world as he saw fit, until finally, by the end of the Third Age, it simply stopped at power, and he was convinced that nearly everyone else felt the same way. This is why in his mind, he couldn't believe that anyone could ever refuse the power of the One Ring, let alone destroy it. And all of this wraps itself up quite nicely with the ironic fact that by depending so heavily upon the submission of others to affirm himself, Sauron lost power. As Tolkien says, A man who wishes to exert power must have subjects who are not himself, but he then depends on them. In conclusion, I feel that the best way to summarize Sauron's philosophy was that he believed that he could be the perfect dictator, and in a hypothetical world, a perfect dictator would be benevolent, organized and efficient, and he wouldn't do anything wrong, and he could guide his people in a perfect way and create an amazing society. However, in practice, this is impossible, because power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. How do you guys feel about Sauron's philosophy, and do you think it's relevant to real-life dictators? I feel that there's something about it that really hits home to humanity. Because as humans, we often notice corruption or inefficiencies, or things that bother us in our society. And sometimes we might feel that, if we were in charge, we could fix everything and set things right. However, these thoughts are very similar to Sauron's. I feel that there's a relevant lesson, that no one person should ever have absolute power. As always, I'd really like to thank my patrons. You guys really helped to make this channel possible, and I deeply appreciate your support especially my wizard tier patrons. Jacob Williams, Michael Angel, T. Gorman, James Stodgel, Mike Feeney, Roland Mervold, Jeremy Pontier, and Big Boy. If you too would like to help and support this channel while unlocking some cool perks, I'll be leaving a link to my Patreon page in the video description. I'll also be leaving links to our Facebook page, Instagram, Discord and Twitter communities. So follow us if you'd like to have some extra Lord of the Rings lore in your day-to-day -day lives. Don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed this video, it really helps the channel. And subscribe to join our fellowship today. I hope to see you all in my next video, where together we'll once again explore the magical world and lore of Middle-earth.